so we are live now just please give me a signal so i'll um, in fact come on aap live kar dijiyega pehle aap apna i'll ask you let's wait for let's wait for a few attendees to join and then we will start the session okay so essence of uh, i'm starting now yes uh, assalam alaikum everyone uh, welcome on board on this interactive session uh, on behalf of entrepreneurship and management excellence center of iobm i would like to welcome you all the panelists uh, the moderators host and the startups joining us today and taking out time uh, the entrepreneurship and management excellence center of iobm works around organizations uh, Uh, development through training and consultancy and you can always visit us uh, on campus and our website once the lockdown is over uh, i do not want to hold between you and the and the session uh, so i would like sn jabbar saab to uh, welcome uh, the panelists please sn jabbar uh, thank you kamran uh, and thank you everyone for being with us i audiences who have joined us for this session aaj ka jo panel hai wo hame government ki taraf se jo hai wo insights aaj hame jo hai wo milengi jo last hamare jo do sessions the usme humne primarily businesses ko dekh rahe the ki wo covid situation se kaise deal kar rahe hain on the government side as well so i look forward uh, for every I'm so sorry. So that's a glitch of um, webinars at some point of times. Okay, internet की वजह से जो है वो disconnect हो जाता है. Anyways, we're back. जी तो ठीक. And uh, I will just tell you a bit about myself. Uh, I am the founder of I Want dot pk, which is Pakistan's B two B platform. we are making something similar that um, alibaba has done for china so we want ke um, through i want we want um, ke pakistan se agar koi buying karna chahta hai to wo i want dot pk ke platform pe aake kar sake that is uh, my startup uh, that i'm currently running and uh, we we going to discuss uh, all these opportunities and and challenges with our panelists as well um, i have my moderators over here uh, fariha shah and imran khalil आई वुड रिक्वेस्ट के आप लोग जो है वो फॉर्मली अपना सेशन जो है वो अभी बिगिन कर सकते हैं स्टार्टिंग ऑफ विद खावर साहब एंड देन वी विल मूव टू वर्ड्स आयशा एंड देन वी विल मूव टू वर्ड्स समर सो ओवर टू यू इमरान एंड फरिया गुड लक थैंक यू कामरान एंड एसन फॉर होस्टिंग दिस वेबिनार ऑन चैलेंजेस एंड ऑपरचुनिटीज बींग फेस बाई बिजनेस फॉलोइंग द कोविड नाइनटीन पेंडेमिक Our today's session is the third webinar of its kind, where we bring leading panelists from different sectors to share their learnings and their views, so that others can learn from their experiences. Our today's panelists are all experts in their fields. We will be exploring their input on challenges and potential opportunities, especially for the youth of Pakistan as Pakistan comes out of COVID. I am also joined by my co-moderator Fariha Shah. if you can uh, please introduce yourself 
Welcome to everyone. Uh, my name is Pariha Shah. Um, as with a lot of uh, other of my colleagues here, I'm part of the IOBM alumni and um, I'm a corporate marketing professional with 20 years of experience uh, in the field with PepsiCo, Philips. Um, it's a pleasure being here today and introducing uh, this August panel because it's, um, it's a very pertinent topic that we're discussing the effect of the current circumstances on Pakistani industry's ability to move forward and to continue expanding both locally and globally. Um, I think our uh, panelists will be able to shed a lot of light on uh, these issues and I, it would be great if you guys can send us your questions on the chat feature so then we can start addressing those as well. Um, I'll hand over to Imran, he's going to start us off with uh, uh, Mr. Khawar and then we'll take it from there. Uh, th thank you, Faria. We, we will also keep this session interactive where our uh, audience can engage and they can also participate through four poll questions that we, that we will be showing on your screens. Uh, as soon as the poll is completed, the results will also display on, on your screens. Uh, we are also joined by two startups. We will be introducing them and also asking uh, them questions uh, that will be followed by 15 minutes of Q&A towards the end, where our audience can also engage by asking questions from our panelists. What I suggest is, if you have anything to ask, use the chat option uh, on, on the screens so that we can make the session interactive. Uh, if I can start off by asking, uh, firstly, a very warm welcome to all, all the panelists. Uh, if I can start off with uh, Vice Admiral retired Khawar Ali Shah Saab, who has been the former ambassador of uh, Pakistan to Maldives and also Director General National Institute of Maritime Affairs, uh, to talk a little bit about, firstly, tell us a little bit about yourself and also share your learnings of the blue economy and what Pakistan can learn from the Maldives experience. Khawar Saab, over to you. <clears throat> Bismillah Rahman Rahim. First of all, let me thank the organizers, Asin Abbas, Kamran Bilgrami, the moderators, uh, Ms. Faria Shah, and Imran Khalil uh, for inviting me. My, I'll be speaking on uh, uh, COVID-19 and what are the challenges and opportunities for the blue economy in Pakistan. So, uh, like Imran has uh, asked, uh, let me... Uh, uh, talk to the participants about my work experience. I was clo been closely connected uh, to the maritime sector since uh, I was in the Navy for 40 years. Uh, in, the, in the Navy, I was uh, at one time looking after the uh, Monora Island and the beaches, and also uh, as a part uh, of the water uh, sports, I was president of the Pakistan uh, Sailing Federation. After retirement, I was posted to uh, Maldives as the ambassador and uh, lived on a small island away from the capital and uh, was able to first-hand experience the effects of the maritime or blue economy. After coming back uh, uh, from Olives, I uh, worked uh, as the Director General National Institute of Maritime Affairs, a think tank, a research uh, body to, uh, for the um, maritime uh, issues. And uh, we uh, were able to produce papers on the freight charges of Pakistan and uh, the improvements required in the shipping sector. Uh, our uh, uh, TORs were, uh, were accepted by the government in the maritime tourism industry for the Prime Minister's uh, task force. And uh, a lot of work for the diving centers in Karachi. So let me uh, start off with my experience in Maldives. Maldives uh, was a very poor country. Uh, uh, it was uh, at per capita $100, stunted growth. People had not uh, uh, even tasted yogurt, no vegetables, legumes. So uh, few entrepreneurs uh, uh, decided to uh, put up a hotel there and a small airport. Uh, be aware of these studies because there was a monumental study by the United UNDP that uh, said that there can be no tourism possible in the Maldives. So if you can imagine that uh, where Maldives is now in tourism. So from uh, this uh, humble start, uh, 
they're they've taken off and they've not looked back. They are they've got the best social indicators in South Asia, under 100 percent free education up to A levels, 100 percent free healthcare, uh, universal uh, uh, pension for everybody who retires of 350 dollars. If you are very sick, they will, even the government will take you out uh, to Singapore or uh, Thailand or India with a attendant. And all this has been possible uh, through uh, use of uh, resources from the ocean, uh, intelligent use of resources from the oceans. So uh, yeah, the Maldives uh, now, uh, if you look at the high-end resorts, they are the risk takers. Uh, you will find people investing in $50,000 a night room, and uh, you won't find any uh, sp uh, spare days available. So this kind of, uh, uh, the banks are ready to lend. The people are ready to take loans and invest in the infrastructure and get on with it. So uh, from a fishing uh, village or a fishing-based economy, now it is a very diversified, but still the tourism is the major part. And the best part is there's no income tax uh, there. All possible through the blue economy. Later on, like I already said, uh, I worked uh, in the uh, National Institute of Maritime Affairs. And uh, for me, it was appalling uh, that uh, a city like Karachi, we don't look south. If you go to the large cities like uh, you know, Sydney or any other Western city, or even now in, the, in our region, there, uh, the whole city is out at sea. So there's so much activity going on. But unfortunately, uh, Karachi uh, Heights or the, we Pakistanis are sort of, uh, uh, we have a sea blindness. We don't look out uh, for opportunities out at sea. I will cover this later. Now, uh, uh, as you all know that uh, apart from our, uh, this, uh, uh, this resource of ocean, we have uh, nearly 1,000 kilometers of pristine and sandy beaches. Uh, we have ideal weather uh, from uh, November to March. So uh, there's no dearth of opportunity uh, which is in this country. Uh, coming to uh, what is uh, blue economy, because uh, this is something which is new. Uh, previously, it used to be the maritime economy, blue economy is a term coined by uh, Gunther Polly. He uh, wrote a, a very famous uh, book, uh, 100 Innovations, uh, 100 Million Jobs. And uh, this became uh, uh, blue economy and, uh, and then this has been taken up by uh, the world. And uh, the uh, difference between the maritime economy and the blue economy is basically uh, the, all the growth on uh, land has been unsustainable uh, in many ways. So the blue economy is the use of uh, economic resources of the sea for uh, betterment of the economy while ensuring that it is sustainable and it does not disturb the health of the ecosystems of the ocean. So this is the uh, basically a rider on uh, what is the uh, blue economy, the difference between the blue economy and the uh, uh, maritime economy. In my opinion, uh, if we work there, uh, it can easily add uh, in a very short term, three to 4% to our GDP. So let me, uh, for, the, uh, for the audience, introduce what uh, maritime sector is all about and what it entails. It's a very complex and a very large sector. First of all, uh, it is a subset of the blue economy. Uh, let me talk about uh, shipping, uh, which is one of the uh, major ingredients of this uh, sector. Uh, we have uh, 13 ships in uh, Pakistan. There's a requirement of 30 to 40 ships. Uh, we annually pay three to four billion dollars in freight charges to foreign shipping companies. Uh, we, as we all know that uh, dollars are scarce in this country and we end up uh, paying uh, so much money uh, for just uh, lifting our uh, short cargo. The next, uh, uh, which has been at the traditional uh, sector uh, in the maritime uh, domain is the uh, f fishing. This is the livelihood of over uh, a million people in, uh, all along the coast. And uh, our uh, problem in the fishing sector is that up to 12 nautical miles, uh, 
this area has been overfished. The boats we use are uh, not uh, of uh, standard uh, boats. Uh, we don't use ice. We use the nets, which are very small. So we, instead of catching a larger fish, we are catching juveniles, which are sell for 50 rupees. While if we wait and we have managed it better, we can catch a fish which can sell for 1500 rupees. So uh, there is a lot of opportunity uh, in this uh, fishing sector also. And then uh, I will talk later about the specifics. And uh, we uh, have this EZ, which is up to 100 nautical miles, which we are not exploiting. So there, there's overfishing near the coast, but there is uh, less fishing in the tuna uh, areas uh, in our EZ. Then uh, there are opportunities in uh, aquaculture. Aquaculture is basically uh, fish farming and uh, shrimp uh, farming. 50% of all the fish production in the world is uh, through aquaculture. In Pakistan, we have a few ponds uh, made by the Marine Fisheries Department. Yesterday, I talked to the uh, Fisheries Commissioner in Karachi, and uh, she told me that uh, government is uh, supporting it in a large way because uh, this is also becomes part of the uh, food security chain. So. Uh, uh, there are, uh, in Pakistan, it's negligible. Few ponds are available in the Habiji and Dharu area. And then uh, we, uh, the other part of this is the maritime tourism, which is uh, absolutely not there. Not a single guest room from Karachi to Gwadar. Or even you can't find toilets. You can't find any sort of facility either west of Karachi or east of Karachi. The beaches uh, are uh, sort of a private property. If you are, uh, you know somebody, you can get uh, uh, not a very nice hut. Uh, so it's a huge uh, uh, <coughs> resource uh, which is lacking in this country. To uh, bring it into perspective, uh, Kerala, a state of southern India, earns about uh, five uh, billion U.S. dollars uh, annually from uh, maritime tourism and the backwater uh, uh, tourism over there. And uh, we uh, have to uh, look in seriously into it. Then we have in this uh, maritime sector, we have the ship breaking, then we have uh, uh, ship building and repair. Traditional DAOs are being made in Pakistan. We were, we were the leaders over there, but now we are losing very fast uh, our position. Others in the region and uh, the ports and harbors are there. The marinas, only one marina club. There, if you go anywhere else, there are uh, uh, marinas everywhere. Uh, we are not using uh, the desalination plants. Uh, desalination uh, is, have, has become a very uh, viable option. And uh, water sports, uh, like already mentioned, uh, we don't have any uh, uh, proper dive water sports or recreational facilities. No cruise ships uh, come here. So the picture is very bright for uh, because everything is rock bottom. Uh, Khawar sahab, if I may come here. So the picture uh, becomes very bright for an entrepreneur. There's a, yeah. Khawar sahab, if I may come here uh, and ask you ke thodi si kuch specifics bhi agar aap share kar sakein. Yes, I'm and coming all... to that. My, I first introduced and the next is uh, the specific uh, issues over there. So uh, what, what I've done is that uh, to uh, come to the uh, uh, doable and uh, manageable uh, things in the maritime sector. I'm not uh, uh, I'm giving you examples of capital intensive things which can be done on the large projects. Uh, this uh, government uh, is uh, talking a lot about the maritime sector. Uh, Prime Minister Imran Khan in February declared uh, uh, 2020 to be the year of the blue economy. And uh, the opportunities uh, in uh, COVID-19, uh, uh, which has uh, emerged, are because uh, thousands of Pakistanis used to visit these exotic beach locations all around the world. Now, all these, uh, they will be uh, not able to travel. So you have this so huge, uh, rich segment. And then you have this 20 million people in Karachi and uh, up country. The whole of Pakistan moves to the north in summers. Why can't the rest of the country come down to the south in the winters if you develop uh, the infrastructure. 
Now coming to the projects which are easily doable and not capital intensive, let me talk about the low hanging fruits. Uh, first of all, which comes in mind is the maritime tourism, uh, small guest houses, uh, tourism villages at scenic spot, eco tours and mangroves, uh, in, as a pub public private partnership, and uh, the government gives the land on lease. Uh, I'm just talking very broadly. Uh, I can come out with feasibility and if somebody wants it and uh, some specifics also very, very uh, detailed. And uh, the cost is uh, 40 to 70 million uh, rupees. And you can also, the land is given by the government. And also if uh, uh, this can be uh, on a time sharing, so if a couple of people get together, they can uh, make the cost even lesser with time sharing things. Next are the safari boats, uh, which uh, in our, the dows which we make in Karachi, uh, if you visit them, they cover, some of them are as big as 2,000 tons, which are used for transportation of goods to Yemen and during the uh, war to Somalia. Now, uh, the, these can easily be converted into floating hotels, which is uh, done a lot uh, in uh, Mauritius, Maldives, and even Dubai. And uh, the cost is not much, uh, 70 to 100 million uh, rupees uh, with a time frame of uh, about a year. And uh, so the floating restaurants, uh, Karachi is hungry for it. The people are ready to pay a premium for that. I think we briefly uh, lost the connection to Kawasab. So while, while he reconnects, uh, what I suggest is, uh, Kawasab, are you on the line? No, uh, I think he's, he's not, um, he's got disconnected. I think he's already disconnected. Okay, I think in the meantime, what we can do is while Kawasab uh, reconnects, we can introduce uh, Aisha and, uh, 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 ask her to share a little bit of insight from uh, f f uh, and also her learnings. Uh, Aisha Moriani joins us. Uh, she's a joint. She's joint secretary WTO at Ministry of Commerce. Uh, Aisha, a very warm welcome to this uh, forum. Uh, please share your learnings with us. Ke, uh, what is Ministry of Commerce doing? Uh, and what are the, some of the initiatives that you are taking to promote businesses in this current environment? Um, Aisha, you're still on mute. Mike, yeah. now you're on mute. Okay, uh, so thank you very much for organizing this uh, webinar and inviting me. Um, I think to deal with the current situation, uh, this is uh, an extremely important initiative. And one of the questions which was given to me was that how can we become a $1 trillion uh, economy? So um, congratulations to everyone that we are already a $1 trillion economy if we look at the purchasing power parity. So we need to make it a $2 trillion now. Um, and uh, obviously there are uh, many challenges. I have been working uh, on trade issues for the last uh, 20 years. Um, uh, we, we have gone through uh, cycles of boom and bust and uh, uh, sometimes there is lack of continuity of policy and uh, there are several challenges in terms of you know, low productivity, we need to spend more on uh, social indicators and improve infrastructure and all those things. 
but uh, as all of you know that uh, this is the age of uh, ICT and uh, the fourth industrial re re revolution um, is basically hinges on having uh, skills and access to IT. Um, and uh, to prepare our country and move in that direction, the Ministry of Commerce came up with an e-commerce policy um, in um, uh, last year. It was approved by the cabinet on 1st of October. And it's a very comprehensive policy which covers um, nine pillars. I will just show you one slide. Uh, just to show that uh, I don't know if it is available. Uh, it's uh, on the uh, mm, oh, I, you have to screen share. Can you see it or no? Can any everyone see it or no? No, it's not yet on the screen. No, not yet. But this share screen is not possible now sharing. It's uh, screen share. Okay, here. Let me. Uh, yeah, this. Okay, uh, everyone can see this now. Now we can see it. Okay, so uh, just to introduce the e-commerce policy of Pakistan, which is um, the latest uh, initiative from the government to encourage employment opportunities, empower youth and uh, women. Um, it looks at the regulatory uh, sides and uh, facilitation of e-commerce. Um, we have coordinated with the uh, various government departments such as SCCP, FPR, um, and uh, other uh, um, uh, you know, uh, institutions involved in uh, State Bank of Pakistan, for example, Ministry of IT, and uh, we are trying to create an enabling environment. Uh, then uh, financial inclusion and payment digitization pillar deals with all the uh, e-payment uh, issues. And we have approached all the um, EMI license holder companies we, who are already provide, who are in the FinTech and then the telecom companies as well. And we are collaborating with State Bank of Pakistan for facilitation. <laughs> And then empowering youth and SME pillar talks about the new opportunities uh, which are there for uh, 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 youth under e-commerce policy. And then the, uh, then the taxation structure is about, uh, you know, creating harmonization uh, within the uh, taxation structure and facilitation of taxation. And then there are some relaxation as well uh, for the income tax if you start an online platform. Uh, then the consumer protection uh, dimension is very important because unless your uh, uh, consumer is satisfied with the service and there is a adequate dispute resolution mechanism available um, on um, online platforms, uh, th that is extremely important for the satisfaction of a consumer. Then ICT and telecom uh, pillar addresses how can we improve access to um, IT equipment and improve internet access facilities across country. And then logistics deals uh, very specifically uh, with all the um, last mile delivery issues and uh, public private partnership. It includes Park Post and then a lot of uh, collaboration with the private sector logistic uh, service providers. Then data protection and investment is about uh, introducing Pakistan's Data Protection Act and cloud policy and encouraging investment in this sector. And then global connectivity and multilateral negotiation includes our active participation in the WTO and all other um, regional and multilateral forums for improving Pakistan's connectivity uh, and joining any negotiation on, on e-commerce and improve Pakistan's market access. So these are actually um, some of the initiatives um, which cover um, uh, e-commerce policy. And uh, you know, Pakistan, I think, uh, is mashallah blessed with a lot of resources. I would say nothing is stopping us. We are stopping ourselves. We just have to have faith and believe in ourselves. And there are so many opportunities within Pakistan and outside Pakistan. In Pakistan, only uh, 15 people out of 100 have access to internet. So with this limited access, we have been able to achieve 47 percent growth uh, in the uh, in uh, let me show you this 
uh, in freelancing. So if with this limited access to internet, we can achieve 47% growth. Just imagine if this access to internet is available to 30 or 35 people, you know, uh, which is very achievable. Uh, we can really do wonders. So I would say uh, opportunities are huge. This is some data which shows that how much growth uh, is happening in which sectors recently in e-commerce. So uh, I think uh, COVID is, uh, provides a lot of challenges to us. But at the same time, I would say this is one of the biggest opportunity for Pakistan. Because Alibaba and Taobao emerged in China during SARS. Um, so there is, I think, the silver lining behind this uh, great challenge is that, uh, as um, our, uh, uh, Asan was saying, that they are planning to make I want .pk as Alibaba of Pakistan. So we need uh, people like him who have faith and conviction and believe in what they are doing. And uh, you just have to take the first step. And um, uh, I think there are huge opportunities lying out there. So under this e-commerce policy, we also approached Amazon. And up till now, uh, uh, it was not possible to register Pakistani seller on Amazon. But with the efforts of uh, Ministry of Commerce and Ministry of Foreign Affairs, we have been able to uh, make this breakthrough. And we are in the process of now opening up uh, uh, shops of Pakistani entrepreneurs on uh, Amazon. And uh, the, this is, you know, some of the progress already made under this e-commerce policy. Uh, we had a very uh, important stakeholder meeting in January um, where uh, all private public stakeholders got together and they thought that there are few immediate things which needs to be done. And we went to the prime minister with all those recommendations. And one of them was that there was a limit on the freelancers uh, on the amount that you could bring in Pakistan because of some of the uh, regulatory issues and uh, FATF uh, conditions. So immediately that 5,000 limit was increased to $25,000 and State Bank has already uh, notified it. Similarly, uh, a Park Post uh, has come up with several new initiatives uh, in terms of logistics. Uh, one of the concern that many entrepreneurs raised was that DHL is so expensive that if a product is uh, 6,000 rupees, we end up paying uh, 6,500 rupees for its transportation. So we need to develop capacity of Park Post. So uh, we, we have a reasonable, uh, you know, uh, service available at a reasonable price. So that is being done um, by the uh, uh, Ministry of Communication and we are also helping them. And then uh, uh, we came up with a, uh, I think um, this uh, e-commerce uh, people were the first one to develop their standard uh, operating procedures uh, when under the COVID-19. And, um, and we were able to work on this because private sector was very closely working with uh, the Ministry of Commerce. Uh, Pasha played a very important role uh, in that. They brought all logistic companies uh, together. And um, uh, while we are uh, we were working on the formulation of um, uh, e-commerce policy, we just developed a WhatsApp group. And we started adding up every uh, one who was interested in it. So we call it e-commerce think tank. And that WhatsApp group helped us so, uh, so much in terms of increasing collaboration and uh, improving coordination. Um, that uh, when we were working on these SOPs, everybody was very actively participating, giving their comments. And uh, uh, within a week, um, SOPs were there and the government was able to suggest the provinces also to adopt uh, those SOPs. So I would say that effective collaboration, one of my learnings of 20 years is that effective collaboration between public and private sector can bring wonderful results. Uh, and uh, another, I think, uh, so in, in my view, you know, where we really need to focus is that we need to develop the ecosystem. Um, and for this, uh, facilitation of venture capital fund is important. Promotion of startup culture is important. And uh, the capacity building of SMEs is important. And uh, I'm sure all of you know uh, about these two uh, recent uh, B2B portals that have come up. One is called Tejarat. 
and they have raised uh, i think 1.6 million dollars and the other, another one is bazaar and they have raised 1.3 million dollars so these are very recent two success stories of e-commerce and i would again say that uh, 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 yes public sector has a role to play but we can only facilitate private sector has to take the initiative and uh, uh, you know take things forward so how do we implement this policy uh, we have an implementation arrangement it, which is called national e-commerce council which is headed by the advisor um, and um, uh, it has uh, several representatives uh, from the uh, private sector as well as public sector and uh, there uh, you know they get together the last one was held in january now we will have a, another one on 18th of uh, june and uh, then the recommendations uh, decisions are made and then if something needs to be taken to the level of the prime minister then uh, things are uh, you know sent to the pm uh, and uh, we get immediate decisions so for example uh, the next one is due uh, in june and we are hoping that whatever recommendations are made there uh, will be uh, you know uh, presented to the prime minister so th this is uh, was uh, something from my side which was actually a very recent initiative uh, by the government there are several other things for example ita is a policy which is complementary to e-commerce policy which is about having better access to it equipment and it's an agreement in the world trade organization uh, ministry of commerce is very actively working on that um, to complete our accession process we are in contact with the it ministry fbr and other uh, important uh, private sector stakeholders so um, any questions Aisha, uh, i'm just going to um, jump in here so i i love the endeavors that the government is doing along with uh, mm -hmm. the whole ecosystem that you're trying to develop and i think that is vital for not just for pakistan in general but especially during these times when we're already uh, we've been hit with this whole the covid situation where the traditional means of doing business are actually uh, being thrown out the window and people are trying to look at new channels um looking at every single industry i know as as a uh, uh, whether you're at home or you're in your office, you're constantly looking for a no contact means of trying to buy and sell. So mm -hmm. one of the key things that I think I would love to have uh, your brief comments on is the fact that in Pakistan, while the e-commerce industry has really grown, but the payment mechanisms still remain very cash based. Um, and in one of our previous mm -hmm. seminars, we also touched upon this, upon uh, how we can bring fintech uh, more actively um, into the consumer's lives and try to get them to adapt to it. And I think nothing has brought this home as much as the current situation mm -hmm. where you're even scared of going physically into a bank. And yes. even people like my husband, who was not did not trust online banking, now has online banking <laughs> activated. So mm -hmm. I think there's a great scope for things to improve there because that's one of the biggest hurdles to people buying and selling online. Um, the second piece, which I think you rightfully said, there is a lot of support that is required for SMEs. And I think later on, Myra will also touch upon this in her part, um, because the mass amount of innovation that comes in the e-commerce sector comes from freelancers and small businesses who find large setups um, too cost heavy. Um, so they go for this non-traditional method. But in Pakistan, even to get a small loan, you ask, ask for a lot of collateral, a lot of uh, assets need to be put down. And then it's not possible for these businesses to even get their supply chain sorted. So I think those two main key points, we could just very briefly touch upon these before we move on to our next participant. One is the payment mechanisms. What will the government do to facilitate these? Uh, can we launch something simpler like cash cards and stuff that people are, um, you know, more comfortable using online? Uh, how do we bring people into the cashless economy? And secondly, what is the government specifically going to do for freelancers and SMEs in order to help them come onto this new platform and exploit it and help us grow it? Uh, you're, you're muted. Status. Okay, so um, you're absolutely right that uh, this uh, uh, transformation uh, is absolutely necessary. Um, and for that, I would say that a lot of policy making has been done. Uh, State Bank has come up with, uh, you know, all the necessary 
uh, rules and requirements which uh, were there to encourage fintech uh, which i think is is a is a great achievement we have for example six seven services available right now and if you are buying something from the raz you get the option you can pay through uh, you know uh, jazz or uh, easy paisa or kinu or you know there there are five six uh, payment options available but you know right now i think the problem is that people don't really feel very comfortable in paying through uh, these uh, digital um, uh, methods they still find cash very easy so a, a lot of uh, work is required um, you know uh, in in raising awareness informing the people a uh, lot of uh, media work is required uh, we have talked to with all these uh, telecom companies and fintech companies uh, with the emi licenses who are providing this service we have uh, we are making a subgroup within the national e-commerce council and all of these uh, payment providers uh, are working together right now and uh, they are uh, developing proposals that how they collectively can collaborate through this That's national it. e-commerce council forum uh, for this transformation um, so i think uh, everyone realizes this and within the policy we have also uh, mentioned that within 3 years of this policy it would not be possible to make more than 10000 payment uh, through cash so uh, and and obviously some of the entrepreneurs had uh, the reasons they were saying that this will discourage e-commerce but we are saying that within this 3 years our pace of adap- uh, adoption of digital payment would be so high that it would not be difficult to achieve this target Uh, of not making any payment more than ten thousand um, on cash, and and uh, you know within ten years we transform completely. Uh, this ten year we had to keep uh, you know uh, we we wanted to keep it actually five years, but uh, many entrepreneurs and then consumers were saying that uh, this is a more ambitious target. But uh, um, we are on it and working on uh, you know if you have. suggestions uh, we would very uh, much welcome but in the 18th uh, uh, national e-commerce council all the fintech and telecom will get together and they will be making proposals and joining hands with the government for moving in this direction that sounds great and on uh, the I access we will, we will probably have some uh, mm-hmm. recommendations so we will share them with you offline yes yes definitely and state bank has come up with some of the you know uh, uh, facilitation for the collateral thing but we are trying uh, through uh, our uh, e-commerce policy we are trying to uh, you know facilitate uh, this access to credit for the it companies and hopefully you will see progress in uh, that direction as well inshallah imran handing over to you uh, th- thank you aisha for for your wonderful insights uh, while while you were uh, giving your insights we asked the audience uh, whether the industry is ready to work from home and 55% of the respondents uh, said uh, they are still not ready so that that's quite a large number uh, i i i would have thought uh, uh, we we've been into the covid work from home situation for several weeks and uh lots of businesses would be getting used to but we still see 55% of the majority saying they're still not yet ready uh i want to move on to our next speaker uh summer uh, abbas who joins us uh from international industries uh, summer i want to get your thoughts on what is happening on the industry side of things with this uh, em- with, with these emerging trends of social distancing safety precautions and where the revenue lines are being challenged generally in the industry so what are your thoughts and what what is happening in uh, in your sector yeah sure uh to see the the situation is very much unprecedented i mean this is maybe the same kind of situation we are experiencing after 100 years so people really don't know how to tackle the situation and every day is emerging situation and we have to decide and uh, move forward uh, accordingly and every day there is a new story uh, so in the in the 
in, in a space whereby people do not have a lot of information and you have to lead is a very uh, much uh, situation or crisis situation whereby the leader does not have information how to uh, uh, lead people uh, so uh, in generally yes it's a, it's a, a very difficult situation uh, because the people uh, uh, I mean, the leader is one, the guys who are managing business is one side, the other side, those who are, um, do are those who are on the receiving end, the, the co-workers and the employees and, and the labor, they are also getting a lot of information and there's a lot of mixed information. Most of the people think that this is a conspiracy theory. Most people think that um, it is can be cured, it cannot be cured. So uh, the lot of information is flowing toward people and they have a mixed minded and uh, the result of is that that people are undecided about that and when people have divergent view to lead them to uh, them toward a specific uh, goal and objective is a, is a very difficult situation so coming about the production side there's a uh, apart from that managing inside there's a regulatory uh, framework because it, uh, the industry was asked to close uh, for a certain period of time that had put a lot of burden on to them um they did so and i just would like to precise here that when the one guy was admitted into aga khan the whole of karachi or or or, or other area uh, inverted commas were closed and today when then we have 90000 people uh, who are career moving around here and there and uh, industries working so there is a confusion here so uh, but at the same time, I appreciate this is a, uh, I mean, uh, unprecedented situation and we have to take decision uh, accordingly. Uh, but the, there, there has to be someone who should be guiding them uh, a little bit more better way than we have done in the past. Uh, as far as industry is concerned, industry, uh, when, we, when we are trying to call people on work, uh, they are not running in. Uh, I'll just I'm discuss, discussing about the different uh, discussion that I had with the uh, different companies. So uh, there are certain companies, they are pushing people to call and they are working in very non uh, um, SOP compliant environment and they continue to operate. At the same time, those there are companies who are uh, SOP compliant and everything and they are expecting the people to come in and they work, but because of the fear, they are unable to, uh, they, they are not joining their office. So there is a very much mixed situation, which is creating a lot of supply and gap disruption in the market. There are certain areas whereby people are uh, asking for uh, availability of products and the product is not available. And there are certain areas the people are continuously producing and the products are not offloaded from the uh, shelves uh, accordingly. So uh, if you talk about my industry, you see this, I'm currently working in a uh, basically building material industry. So uh, initially it was uh, uh, all closed, nothing was allowed. So the, there was a standard situation. We had to take a uh, hit, a lot of uh, uh, fixed cost uh, hit, uh, but uh, eventually now it has been resumed uh, partially, I would say, and with a lot of, uh, of course, uh, compliance requirement. So we have uh, resumed it and uh, a lot of people are um, uh, other industrialists uh, are uh, have uh, resumed their operations but at the same time this has created a lot of uh, um, a liquidity gap in the market because once the all market was closed so the most of the sales in the market is based on the uh, credit sales so when the people were not opening their shop and the, books, uh, and the uh, goods were not moving uh, out of the shelf they were unable to uh, pay uh, their debts and that has created a circular uh, debt situation across the different level of uh, channels from retailer to distribute uh, retailer to wholesale and wholesaler to distribute and distribute to the manufacturer so this is uh, again a very challenging situation although uh, state bank of pakistan and government has announced some initiative uh, of uh, easing the liquidity but i'm not sure whether uh, it's it's really uh, addressing the issue or not because even for um, for uh, when they announced to give uh, uh, for example uh, reduced uh, 
reduced uh, loan, reduced rate interest, uh, uh, reduced interest rate loan for paying uh, salaries. Uh, against that, they have put a lot of uh, collateral requirement. The company like us, yes, we uh, because it's a listed company and we have a very um, a good reputation with the institutions. Uh, we we could afford to do that, but a lot of people who are small and medium organizations, uh, I don't think so that this uh, this this decision has really uh, benefited the uh, employer or salary. And there are a lot of people are being laid off. And uh, so this this is the situation. Uh, and uh, since we are talking about uh, specifically the opportunities and the impact that business is going to have um, uh, in the post COVID scenario, but we have to take into consideration that we were just discussing uh, about the COVID things and associated problem. But recently there is a um, local situation in uh, Sindh and uh, Punjab. So that is also going to hit uh, the overall economy and cash, uh, cash circulation uh, in, in the economy. In the initial discussion that, that we were having, they said that there is an impact of 600 billion rupees uh, that uh, that is going to have an impact on the agri agriculture economy. But this is one side of agriculture economy. It will have a definitely a, a multiplier effect on the industrial economy also. So. Uh, I just, just, like uh, just like to interrupt here. So while uh, at the beginning of the COVID situation, construction and everything came to a halt, but yeah. now that was one of the first things that the government opened up. So yeah. um, keeping that in mind and, and the fact that you are manufacturing locally on site, how much of your um, raw materials are import based and how do you see yourself coming out positively on the other side of the current situation? You see, the most of the uh, you have seen that import has gone down in, in Pakistan uh, over the period of time because of the taxation and uh, and so and overall uh, uh, blooming situation of the economy past 18 months. I would say, see, our for example, in our case, most of the the, the basic raw material is HR. HR nobody is manufacturing. We just a couple of days we have been uh, um, uh, hearing the news of uh, steel mill. Which was which was basically not was not an operation, but uh, and it was irrelevant. But uh, uh, the most of the raw material is imported, uh, and uh, the but the question is not that we have enough raw material to supply uh, to the need of the market, but the the problem is that the tap is closed because because of this FBR um, uh, drive to bring into the uh, uh, non-documented economy into uh, into document uh, documentation, uh, the people the the, the the investor has uh, is not there. For, from I'm talking about specifically a, a real estate uh, market. So the construction is down and um, the, the regular activity is not going on. So because of this, the overall construction industry, you name it cement, steel, or rebar, they are uh, facing a, a difficult time. They may they they they, they definitely had to a good time two years back. But since for the last two years, all the companies who are in, in the manufacturing of building materials, they are just on uh, survival modes and coming, going ahead uh, because of the impact of the COVID as well as this locus, uh, the situation going to go worse, uh, I believe so. And uh, uh, the, the, good, the good part, uh, the good thing I would see in, in this is because of the technology and uh, this, period uh, of, of downturn will be a little shorter one uh, rather than that what we had seen the pre in the past. For example, if you just go back 100 years back when this uh, Spanish flu came or after Great Depression, it took uh, decades to come back to that level. Uh, but as we move forward and the last financial crisis, it took five years. So uh, in coming uh, in the, the, the current situation, although Pakistan economy was not enjoying very high pace of growth, but it's still uh, come to uh, the back to normal. I personally see that it would take another 18 months uh, uh, by the time we ha can say that we have resumed uh, where we was uh, where we were. So uh, what we have to do is is brace for impact. Uh, I mean, I'm, I'm I'm really sorry that I that based on my feeling, I'm not giving a lot of good news to you. But at the same time, uh, we have to go for uh, this year. We have to. We all have to try to just pass over 
rather than focusing on the growth mode or anything else there definitely will be certain areas like she like ms aisha was highlighting like uh, e-commerce yes there will be or if you go for a pharmaceutical industry yes there are area for growth uh, but you have to come uh, if you are talking about your own industry uh, uh, if you are not uh, with, uh, with the certain areas where actually things are growing then you have to think differently and you have to reset put a reset button what we have done for, the, for example for the last two uh, for the last two months uh, when we were not allowed to work we have really put the reset button we have taken every market every procedure every uh, way of working and try to look at from the uh, from the new angle so that was the fabulous opportunity that has uh, uh, given us some time to look and look at our business as usual from a different perspective, which we were unable to do so uh, in, in, in when the business is normal. So in doing so, um, we have come up and develop uh, their uh, new products and new market has emerged where we, we would like to focus. So uh, the, uh, as far as the opportunity is concerned, I would like to say the opportunity was there to rethink what you were doing. Uh, in terms of the markets, in terms of the uh, uh, operational procedures, and in terms of the way you work uh, with your people and with your customers. And because of that exercise, we were able to ident identify two different industries. And uh, another thing was that uh, we keep on, we should keep on reimagining, uh, uh, we should keep on reimagining that how you are going to address if you keep on focusing too much focusing on your industry and the way you the way you the way you used to work i think in my opinion uh, the time ahead will be even more difficult uh, you have to come up with the uh, fresh approach uh, reimagining whatever you are doing uh, and try to bring in the impact of technology into it even if it is your industry is not uh, uh, very much uh, technology uh, impacted. Try to bring it how you can do, how you can, uh, uh, how you can inculcate technology to make yourself better. Uh, th these are the opportunities that you have. Uh, otherwise, I see uh, for the large industries uh, that the next year would be quite uh, challenging. Thank you, Summer. Yeah. Thank you, Shamar, uh, for, for your wonderful insights. Uh, while we were talking to you, we also asked the audience uh, their dependency on the local manufacturing. And 60% of the respondents said uh, that uh, they're dependent on the local manufacturing. Now, this is a number that is increasing compared to the import side of things. So that's, so that's a good trend to see. I, I hope that is also a trend for the wider community or for the wider business uh, audience. Uh, I want to bring in Khawar Saab here. We lost connection uh, with Khawar Saab. He's back online now. Uh, we were asking him about specific examples of how our youth can benefit from uh, various opportunities. So Khawar Saab, if briefly you can share some of the remaining points that you were sharing so that the audience, uh, especially the youth, uh, uh, can, can hear about some of the opportunities going forward. Uh, your, your mic's muted, Khawar Saab. Uh, can you hear me now? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, okay. uh, th thank you, Imran. Before this technical uh, glitch occurred, I was talking about the opportunities in uh, the uh, safari boats, aquaculture, and uh, maritime small guest houses. I've listed uh, a lot of a, a big list because uh, this is a virgin territory. Uh, we have not looked at ocean resources at all. So uh, the desalination plants, small desalination plants all along the coast can uh, generate a lot of uh, money and employment. Then improving the efficiencies of the uh, fishermen because uh, we are using technology of, of the yesteryears. And we can invest in a deep uh, sea uh, fishing trawlers. That is uh, like uh, 70 to uh, 100 million rupees with a good uh, ROI. Uh, coming to Slytus uh, expensive projects, the sea under CPAC, 
there is a lot of opportunity for uh, funding is available also for uh, for the chinese to make an expensive resort uh, investment like a billion rupees and the elite uh, from pakistan uh, can uh, uh, go there a uh, small ferry uh, which i am sure miss uh, aisha would uh, from being from tdap i worked with uh, uh, madam javeria in the past so a uh, small cargo ship pakistan is losing a lot uh, due to uh, less connectivity uh, i uh, went and talked to a lot of people in pnsc to buy small ships because uh, india has a big advantage in areas like sri lanka uh, africa and uh, because of their connectivity if we buy small ships for our fresh produce rice this uh, it's easily doable not much money is uh, involved and uh, uh, this can be a big boost to the exporters as well as uh, for the investor in these kind of uh, uh, assets then uh, there is a theme park this is slightly uh, a billion rupees sort of uh, small theme parks all along the coast surfing Uh, you would be surprised that uh, why did i say that the government is the main culprit uh, pakistan produces the best waves during monsoon and the government imposes section 144 nobody can go to the beach so uh, india is thriving with surfing schools They're just next door in monsoons uh, uh, we have the, one of the best waves and the only surfing school in pakistan is opened by an american in hawks bay he is migrated from santa monica in california phonia to oxbay and he's running a surfing school there so there's uh, you know sky is the limit in this area uh, because uh, uh, and the million dollar question which i have to end my talk is that with uh, what's going on uh, with so much uh, opportunities available why nothing is happening and uh, uh, it's uh, you know it's a mad house you, the whole of the area is uh, the rules of business you get into the sent government the whole of the coastline is being divided there's a turf guarding from pqa to kpt to dha to to uh, the security agencies to msa to the navy to the nu- nuclear part to the army uh, where does the uh, common man go so uh, the provincial governments nobody is ready to uh, uh, talk to each other and uh, look at the uh, uh, holistic picture and it becomes a nightmare when we wanted to uh, put some uh, it's a simple thing like a diving center rules and regulations when you put it uh, across to the agencies we have ended up in the supreme uh, this high court of sin uh, with a stay order so you can imagine uh, it's the ease of business is a mess uh, so that we need to and with this uh, uh, the roles of the universities uh, there is so much uh, capacity building which has to be done if you want the sector to go iobm uh, uh, can open uh, because unless the, there is a capacity for the people to handle this uh, there will be no growth it will just a one off uh, success story so the universities the skill building centers the universities have to take the lead also do the researches to prepare the feasibility studies expertise is available in the country for that and people like me and people like you we need to advocate uh, do a lot of ed- advocacy uh, to the government But this uh, you know i i thought uh, it's a big topic i just uh, try to you know uh, just encompass it in a few minutes uh thank you i'm sure the you can benefit with some of the opportunities uh can can we have a third poll before we go to the startup speech Uh, Khabar sir, just so you know that IOBM also has um, uh, an MBA in environmental management as well. So it is going in the direction that you're asking for universities to help build capacity. But I think one thing that would really help is um, more interaction between uh, qualified people like yourself. and the institutes to actually look at the opportunities uh, plus some government um, interaction and presence to make sure that we at least identify the top 3 or 4 and then work towards that in the immediate future because mashallah the things that you've shared and I've actually taken notes there there's so many um, opportunities out there that as a regular student or an entrepreneur or a person trying to set up something you wouldn't think this far because maritime the industry unfortunately is not top of mind for a lot of us um, 
I know a lot more about it because one of my mamus was a merchant mariner, um, a career merchant mariner. So I've been exposed to that. But a lot of the people uh, in my circle are not aware that there is just so much opportunity just waiting to be tapped. So I think more active involvement from gentlemen like yourself, along with the right SOPs in place to make things accessible and easier would go a long way in making this, uh, bring this to the forefront for a lot of generations. Uh, uh, if if I may uh, take a minute, uh, thank you for it. The IOB uh, is at located at Korangi. You can see the sea of uh, not very far from there. Uh, it is CBM, I believe, uh, and uh, uh, so yes. uh, universities have to take the lead. They have to get out of the comfortable world of academia and uh, stop uh, borrowed research from the West and uh, publishing it all the time. Just get on uh, with the proper researchers uh, which are there and uh, do a forward integration and get into small businesses. The incubation centers need to uh, do that. And people like us are volunteer for whatever uh, you know uh, we are worth uh, to the universities and the people can use us uh, and uh, to take our time. We have, uh, you know, uh, uh, there to serve uh, uh, the people. Inshallah. Thank you. Uh, once again, thank you, Khabar Sahib. Uh, can, can we show the results of the third poll, please? So 71% of uh, our audience is positive uh, about the sentiments for growth going forward over the next two years. That That's quite uh, interesting. Uh, as, uh, as we pass through this COVID situation. Uh, our, our format for this webinar also includes two startups who have joined us today. So, so I would like to go to them so that we can hear a little bit about them. Shahir Ahmed from Tech Tree joins us. Shahir, uh, a very warm welcome. Please uh, hame batayen apne startup ke baare mein. So uh, over to you. Hi, everyone. So... Uh, I guess Imran already introduced me. Uh, I'm Shahir from TechTree. Uh, we started this startup back in 2016 and we got incubated at the Nest. Uh, the Nest IO is a tech incubator uh, funded by Google, run by Pasha. Uh, Jahan RIP, you probably have heard her name is basically taking after that. So our idea was, uh, so basically I, I, I like to talk about the pain that, you know, basically what, you know, actually uh, made us realize that we should come up with uh, you know such a startup. Uh, I am I am personally an electronic engineer, and when I graduated, I you know actually felt that you know in Pakistan, uh, especially in like you know in all the universities, uh, you won't find like you know people who are passionate about you know studying those subjects. <clears throat> Similar was the case with like you know our engineering university. So out of like around 250 students batch, you can actually find like you know, perfect engineers. Uh, uh, which are which were the strength was like around you know just five to ten so, or, or the people whom you can actually call like you know they're like perfect engineers everyone else was you know just you know trying to grab their degrees and it was happening all around the country so we can't produce like this, this is one of the pain that we can't produce like you know amazing engineers amazing entrepreneurs because uh, people that's what that that's like the vision of our startup as well that you know people lack vision in pakistan and by vision, you know, vision comes like, you know, in every dimension. It's not like, you know, just focus towards career. Uh, if you talk about health, if you talk about spirituality and, the, you know, the list goes on, you know, so, uh, people, you know, generally lack vision. And the reason was that, you know, in Pakistan, people are taught what to think rather than how to think. So this was like the major problem in Pakistan in our whole education system. This is like, you know, this is like, this is the major problem that you're, you know, completely, you, you're teaching this, you know, you should do this, you should do that. That's going to be the examination pattern and everything. So basically the critical thinking, and I will say creativity isn't there anymore. Uh, so that's what, you know, uh, that, that is like, you know, that, that was a pain that we wanted to resolve. And uh, since we were engineers, what we wanted to do was, that, you know, uh, if we want to like, you know, uh, we want to bring up like, you know, amazing entrepreneurs in the country who, who can, you know, escalate the economy or we want like amazing engineers who can, you know, again, lift the economy and people who are uh, in, STEM, in STEM fields, STEM is basically an acronym which stands for science, technology, engineering and mathematics. People who are in STEM fields, you know, basically earns more or they, you know, they basically uplift the economy. 
uh, basically this acronym came from uh, it, it it basically you know U, uh, united states of america realized it when they realized that you know their population who are like you know a part of stem uh, will decrease in 2025 so they started you know focusing on their education and you know basically inclining the interest of students towards stem fields uh, it it includes you know engineering and you know all all the fields which basically you know target technology engineering and mathematics and science of course so what we did was that we started manufacturing different uh, products different educational robotic kits uh, for basically school going kits we did like focus group testing on uh, you know different uh, segments of uh, basically like school graders teachers uh, college graders university students and you know, all of that uh, so we, we realized that you know when we were at the nest that school graders are the perfect uh, perfect people who were who had amazing imaginative power the imaginative power was resilient so we started focusing on the uh, school uh, students and what we did was basically we realized that you know hands on application is like you know completely missing we were never taught. for example you are you are being taught math in such a way that you have to solve uh, this like x is equal to y but you never know you know what x stands for or you have to do this pi r square you know this you know this is the formula for calculating the uh, the uh, area of the circle but you know you the practical implementation wasn't there anyway so mathematics was taught in a very pathetic way all over the country and i i won't say like it, it's just about a national curriculum maybe cambridge curriculum or you know ed excel curriculum or any other curriculum and that's what you know you are being uh, you are basically teaching in schools that you know you should you know solve this these are the past papers you, you're gonna you know excel in such a way so basically uh, if you want to have a vision uh, and if you like, you know, study the biographies of these amazing entrepreneurs, if I, if I talk about Jobs or if I talk about Mark Zuckerberg who came up with Facebook and, you know, all of these amazing Jeff Bezos. So they basically get exposure at some point in their early years, which basically, you know, helped them to come up with such a vision. If you talk about Steve Jobs, uh, we know that he was a great marketer, but he was going to ele electronic garages when he was just probably seven years old. Similar is the case with Zuckerberg. So we wanted to give, so we started giving exposure in schools. So we collaborated with different schools. The city school is one of our major clients. We have their 83 branches all over the country. We, we are basically, we have revamped their ICD curriculum and we have, uh, you know, incorporated hands-on approach, which is like the STEM education approach where you basically give them a real world task and they basically apply their like you know their theoret uh, theoretical stuff like you know these formulas mathematical formulas scientific knowledge and all of that apart from that we make educational robotic kits as well through which we can teach coding and you know all of these fields for example we know about coding like you know software houses is like you know is one of the booming industries in pakistan as well but you know how many fields are there uh, you know it's it's very rare that you know students basically know that what's the difference between data scientist or you know, back-end developer, front-end developer, what you can do with, you know, different technologies. So that is what we are doing right now as well. We are giving exposure in like, you know, in different fields. And it, 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 uh, it basically, it stretches from like, you know, software engineering to mechanical electronics and all of that using different kits, different tools, and basically incorporating them and making it a part of the curriculum. Uh, and uh, during this uh, COVID, uh, you know, pandemic season, uh, it, it actually, you know, the schools, you know, closed all of a sudden and we also lost the business, but we came up with this idea to basically launch our online classes and we, we ran amazing on, uh, and we, 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 we didn't know that, you know, ourselves as well, that we are going to teach students from Jamshoro, Mandi Bhautin, Palia, and, you know, all those cities where we, we never thought that we'll be able to, you know, go like we will be able to have them like you know so soon through a platform so we launched our online platform where we were sending our you know basic kits to their home and then we, we were running workshops it, it went really amazing so that's all from uh, you know my side my perspective any questions if you want to ask him thank you so much for sharing all of that i think it's a great uh, effort that you guys have made and something so relevant now, especially in the current situations where most of the schools are even closed and we have online learning happening, uh, much to some of our <laughs> exasperation as moms with kids at home. But I think it's amazing that we have something which is based in Pakistan and is focused on Pakistani students um, specifically to help them. Thank you so much, Shaheed. Um, we're going to move on now to our second startup, which is Sage that is headed by Mahira Asad. Mahira is a financial uh, specialist. She's a chartered accountant and she's been in the corporate uh, world for the last 15 to 20 years. I'm going to exaggerate a bit. 
um, but she has started something based on textiles uh, within Pakistan as well as uh, trying to pull together an e-commerce based export operation outside focused uh, in the Middle East. So I'm going to hand over to Myra to introduce herself and to give us a brief uh, background to her company. Over Thank to you, Myra. Myra. So part of the introduction you've already given, I am a qualified chartered accountant uh, and, and I do have almost 20 years of experience now uh, split between PwC and uh, FMCG uh, corporation in the food and beverage sector. So as we speak, I am currently doing a job and sometime back in 2016, I just got a bit bored of finance. So I wanted to venture out into entrepreneurship to see, okay, uh, what we can do while, you know, having a job as well as, uh, you know, sitting outside of Pakistan. I wanted to stay connected to Pakistan and bring something good out of from Pakistan to you know the outside world. So this was the venture or idea that I came up with that you know we, we know the strength of Pakistan textile is uh, we are one of the top leading cotton manufacturers and known as one of the best textile producers in the world. So I picked on this industry and uh, more specifically into home textiles. Uh, to come up with a you know brand uh, option and then leverage e-commerce to market a product. Um, but somewhere during you know the course of this time, we kind of changed the strategy a bit and uh, started uh, uh, selling locally in Pakistan to get more experience of e-commerce and then eventually uh, export is something we want to look at for further expansion. So um, in Pakistan, the e-commerce uh, environment setup, uh, it's been three years since we've been operating this uh, e-commerce setup and brand um, is, you know, it's growing very rapidly as Aisha has already spoken about it. There's, you know, uh, almost, we can say more than 50 to 90% growth in various uh, sectors. So there is huge opportunity. It's, it's still nascent. So while textile is a uh, uh, you know, mature category uh, from one aspect, but e-commerce is not. So those two made a perfect combination for us to say, okay, we can come into a market as a startup uh, where we have big players, you know, uh, some of the very known brands, uh, but they're not very well um, right now established into e-commerce. They still are also making progress. So, uh, so we're doing well, we, we started with one category and we realized that, you know, home textile, home decor is a huge industry and IKEA, I would pick it as an example, or as an aspiration, eventually maybe is something what we want to do, uh, but we've started small and uh, as we go along, we hope that, you know, uh, those new categories from a supply chain perspective can also be supported by, by the government, by the country itself, more entrepreneurs come in and we could uh, build scale. Uh, so, so this is, you know, a product-based uh, venture, what Shahi was talking about. We see a lot of tech-based uh, ventures that are coming in. And my learning uh, from, from this uh, venture has been from an SME perspective, from an e-commerce perspective. And Aisha, you've spoken about some of the things, but I would just like to touch upon a little bit uh, on some of those is that the opportunity that, you know, uh, right now lies in, I, I'm going to not talk about them as challenges, but rather as opportunities are in three, uh, you know, basic or key sectors or four, I'd say. One is the financial services and um, access to finance, which Faria also touched upon before. While you did say, Aisha, that, uh, you know, the Ministry of Commerce is collaborating with State Bank, and uh, you know, coming up with solutions, but unfortunately, the commercial banks um, they are very stringent in the requirements. So they add on to what state bank would say. So if you know, state bank is um, trying to uh, bring out a conducive environment, but it's not trickling down to commercial bank level. So I think that is uh, maybe an area of opportunity where some more work needs to happen. And uh, it's uh, for, for as and when we will see more uh, service-based, uh, you know, e-commerce or IT setups come in, um, uh, they will not have, uh, you know, tangible assets to take to the bank to say, okay, we need, we need access to finance. So, so I think 
somewhere the, the that, that policy needs to be revisited uh, at both levels, commercial as well as state bank level. Um, and in terms of financial services, also we you have spoken about digitization, uh, you know, of of the financial services. This pandemic uh, proved to be, you know, obviously that um, time where we realized the importance of touchless banking or remote banking or internet banking. And there have been some good steps that, you know, were taken by banks. So we did see some flexibility, but still I think, um, and when we, when we saw that we realized that yes, banks are taking that, you know, those initiatives to, to be able to help, you know, the work to continue they have flexed themselves, so why not go at least three more steps and make the life of entrepreneurs and commerce people a lot more easier. So I think those are two big area of opportunities in the financial services uh, side. The other one is the impact uh, that we felt in this pandemic. So e-commerce as you know, an industry, I think saw a boom. And um, I, as a consumer have, you know, shopped for everything while I live in the way. So obviously e-commerce is much more established here from a, a hairpin to a shampoo, to groceries, to medical supplies, electronics, everything you can get delivered. So, so I think delivery and logistics uh, piece of this whole as huge opportunity if in our business in Pakistan, you know, I'm, I'm always connected to my teams. We have seen these logistic companies just uh, kind of lost uh, the, the balance. They were, they're overwhelmed with e-commerce deliveries. They're delivering and you can see on Facebook, people are writing stuff that they're getting, you know, missing products uh, or, you know, package um, with empty products. They're being delivered. In our case, you know, wrong products being delivered, which don't even, are not even our company products. So someone delivered a tray instead of a bed sheet, for example. So I think uh, there's huge opportunity. And I would say that that is because we don't have any options. So as you know, this, this logistics and transportation network to support e-commerce needs to um, be developed more. And you uh, talked about Pakistan Post. I think we have a great platform. They have been progressing in the last few years. There's a bit more digitization apart from, you know, the international uh, piece uh, within the local piece as well uh, they can improve a bit more and um, uh, and personally you know from let's say 10, 10 years ago versus the last five six years Pakistan Post has really you know they have moved to the digital side but still you know st still banking also so uh, the, the uh, receipts that would have to come in from cash on delivery could directly be delivered to the bank this can make the life of Pakistan Post a lot, lot easier as well. So these are some of the opportunities I see in logistics and trans transportation. And then also in you know, e-commerce business management tools. And this is where this, this IT you know, side of uh, this whole um, uh, you know, new, new industries that are coming in. Uh, I think the government probably also needs to invest a bit more in uh, uh, or, or we need to see more of those uh, companies coming up that can facilitate, you know, business management for e-commerce setups. Uh, taxation is another, uh, another one, and that that uh, um, you have already spoken about that there are some uh, benefits being given to uh, e-commerce. Uh, so I think if we work, if you think of e-commerce from a future perspective, uh, there is huge potential. We are going to see growth. Uh, I think giving them tax breaks, incentives, or whatever the government can do to promote e-commerce, especially at the SME level, is going to go a long way. So I think that uh, there. Thank you, more, Myra. Uh, thank, uh, th thank you, Myra. I'm just conscious of the time. Uh, we have only a few minutes, and I. Uh, sure, sure, sure. Uh, thank. Uh, we are sharing. I just want to add one last sure. point, Imran, which is an important one. Uh, and that is that uh, just like I am uh, an overseas Pakistani who, who is willing to invest in Pakistan, I think because of uh, the, this uh, you know, uh, new world we are in, uh, connectivity is easy. This can also be an area of opportunity for Ministry of Commerce to look at how they can bring in more investors being uh, stationed outside, but yet investing in Pakistan 
e-commerce setup. So, so that is, uh, in my view, something we should also look at. Thank you, Mahira. Um, I think there's a lot of valid uh, points that we picked up and uh, Aisha, I'll connect you to Mahira offline so you guys can have some nice discussions on this. Um, what we're going to do now is quickly move on to the Q&A and, uh, and then Imran will take it from there. So Imran, can you ask the questions that we have? Khabar sure. uh, we have a question for you. Uh, how can we revive Pakistan's blue economy uh, especially after all the challenges that you mentioned, uh, lots of things can be done here in Pakistan with the opportunity, but what's your suggestion? How do we cut through the bureaucracy to get things done? Uh, your, your mic's muted. Uh, yeah, let me uh, unmute. Uh uh, Imran, it's a, a very valid observation, and this is the, the quagmire or the, uh, where we are stuck. Uh, we have to get the government in the act. Uh, there is uh, ignorance uh, at all levels. People don't understand the issues uh, very well. So th that becomes a bottleneck, and uh, the speed is uh, very slow. And then uh, the entrepreneur uh, loses interest. They just can't wait forever for the government to act, get the act together. But uh, we are hopeful that uh, this time uh, the government has uh, got the right ideas. Uh, and we, people like us need to push and interact with, uh, with the government to get their act together. And this includes the local government and the provincial governments. Thank you, Kavar Sahib. I think uh, another question that we have in this regard is again, uh, the fact that maritime industry is uh, playing a very big role worldwide. But the key thing to do is to digitize uh, all of its uh, processes and the data exchange in our ports as well. Um, and the question in this regard is for, is for Aisha that uh, has the Ministry of Commerce prepared or sent any proposal to relevant ministries regarding these kind of digitizations of the primary government departments to facilitate moving into uh, the digital section and trying to make sure we have more efficiency in all the transactions that happen. Yeah, um, yeah, that is mainly the function of Ministry of Information uh, and Telecommunication. Mm -hmm. And they have a whole department which is called uh, National IT Board. Um, and uh, they have this responsibility of ensuring that all government departments uh, are digitalized and, you know, uh, in terms of connectivity. So uh, Ministry of Commerce uh, can encourage IT businesses to come forward and uh, we we try to ensure that the policies provide a level playing field and uh, uh, private sector can play its role uh, by making use of those business opportunities. Uh, but uh, it's not one of our Ministry of Commerce functions to ensure that other government departments are connected. Yes, it is part of the e-commerce policy. For example, we are saying that e-procurement, uh, you know, has to be adopted by 2022 by all government departments. Uh, but then uh, PEPRA is working on it and, uh, you know, uh, uh, government departments have to do it on their own. And we have uh, a mechanism to ensure that PEPRA comes and ris gives response in every National E-Commerce Council meeting and informs about the status and all those things. Uh, but uh, we can improve efficiency, for example, through this ITA agreement that we are working at which is about you know, reducing duties, taxes, tariffs on IT products so that IT product is easily available. Malaysia is a signatory to that IT agreement and one of the benefit that they had of, uh, of that agreement is that their uh, you know, uh, filing of uh, taxpayer has increased, online filing has increased in Malaysia because there was better access to IT equipment. Uh, so we, we can again help in creating an enabling environment but then each and every department has to work, you know, in that direction. Thank you. Well, Faria, may, may I add a comment on this? Yes, please go ahead. Uh, what I what I've seen of like TAD, AP, and the government department bureau of stats, and I'm saying with full responsibility, the data collected is not right, uh, the data published is not right, so it becomes a huge problem for uh, everybody once you start using the data. And uh, so uh, without, uh, you know, this, the world is now big data. So uh, the Ministry of Commerce, uh, TDAP figures, the 
market, uh, trade figures, the VBOC figures, the, the collection is bad. Uh, so we need to, what Aisha, I agree with her, but uh, there is the need to, you know, uh, for the government uh, get, get the data correct. Otherwise, nothing will uh, uh, be uh, correct later on if you base your work on that. Uh, Summer, any last words from you before we close? Can I, can I just respond to the data collection of trade? Uh, just to clarify that, you know, uh, for the data collection of trade, it can't be wrong because it is collected at the place where it, it is generated. Uh, the only thing is that uh, you may find a difference between the state bank data or the PRAL data or because there is a time lag. So a state bank collects a data, which is when uh, uh, proceeds, you know, when the money comes back. It's not uh, when order is uh, uh, shipped or it has crossed Pakistan's border. So state bank data is always, uh, you know, the most conservative uh, uh, in terms of providing the figures that how much is exported. Uh, but uh, Pral, Vibok, Ministry of Commerce then reconciles all the data. And then when Ministry of Commerce comes up with the trade data, uh, that is very factual. And that is given to the whole world. And the whole world relies on Pakistan's trade data on the basis of what is communicated to them. Yes, there could be difficulties in other type of data. Um, and I, I mean, there are limitations in the government. But I do agree that big data is something which is used in many countries in the world for policy and planning. And that uh, uh, is a good trend. Uh, but I don't think each and every government data is wrong. Um. Uh, take a second. Uh, I've been uh, in the state bank last uh, for the last one year, at least four or five times for a number of hours. And we were trying to research this freight issue. And uh, so uh, it was uh, a nightmare for us because uh, we were surprised at the uh, data which is uh, where the state bank is making decisions on. It, I'm not saying everything is wrong. I'm saying uh, uh, it needs uh, compared to other countries. If you compare Reebok, the other stuff to the other countries, uh, and if you check uh, your uh, export and import data with uh, other countries, you find a lot of discrepancies. So I, we are just saying as a researcher that so there is a problem. We are not criticizing. We understand the problem. But uh, we, we, we were into a shock when we uh, got into the researchers in the state bank. Thank you, Howard. Uh, which we Thank uh, you, Aisha. So La Sorry. Just, just last, some, some last words from Summer before we close. Uh, Summer, your mic's muted. Uh, I can say that the situation is very much unprecedented. Okay? So this is a big confusion in all of them. Those who are also involved as a, as a society, whether they are an entrepreneur, ho, uh, as a manager, who operations ko chala rahe hain, ya phir employees ho, as a as a human being. So, we have to expectations thodi si correct karni padengi. And because of the uh, expectation management, that creates create a lot of dissatisfaction, and that put us into the uh, vicious circle of uh, not being satisfied and and then reacting accordingly. So, usme jo main, there are definitely opportunities. Uh, for example, you also say that when a person dies, there is also an opportunity for someone who is in the graveyard related to the graveyard. Yes, they are. But at the same time, the situation in front of us is a very humanitarian crisis. There is also an economic crisis and a humanitarian crisis. So, you all and those who are listening to me, I would like to request that you try to uh, think uh, a holistic picture. We are running after growth, 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 growth. And, uh, and here we are also talking about that opportunities and growth. You see, if we keep this mindset, this will not, uh, uh, in, this is my understanding that might not work out for the benefit of everybody. So just expectation of me, say, we don't know. Okay, so Pakistan situation is we are double jeopardy, like a agriculture crisis, we have a health crisis, we are not equipped for that. And this decision making expectations and low is taxing everybody's brain. So, this may up expectations to be lower, please. 
और कॉपरेट करें एक एक दूसरे के साथ कंपेशन के साथ एम्पैथी के साथ चाहे वो वर्कर्स हों चाहे वो एम्प्लॉयज हों चाहे वो इंटरप्रेन्योर्स हों और एक साल या डेढ़ साल से कोई फर्क नहीं होने वाला ठीक है एज ह्यूमन वी आर रिजिलियंट सौ साल पहले इस तरह की जब चीज़ें आई थी तब भी रिजिलियट करके और उससे बाउंस बैक करके पूरी ओवरऑल वर्ल्ड इकोनॉमी आज एज ए प्रोडक्टिविटी कहाँ पहुँची हुई है तो उस सूरत में मैं सिर्फ ये कहना चाह रहा हूँ कि अपनी थोड़ी सी एक्सपेक्टेशन मैनेजमेंट करें और इस साल को सर्वाइवल का नाम दें ठीक है और उसी तरह निकालें कोशिश करें अपने गिर्द इतने जो भी हालात जो लोग हैं और जो आपसे अटैच हैं एज 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 ए सोसाइटी और एज ए इकनॉमिक सर्कल उनको हेल्प आउट करें और इसको कोशिश करें कि एज ए सर्वाइवल निकाल लें अगर हम बहुत ज़्यादा खींचेंगे एक दूसरे को यानी कि जैसे मैंने आपको बात बोला कि एक की अपॉर्चुनिटी दूसरे के लिए प्रॉब्लम बन जाती है तो एज अ होल एज ए सोसाइटी सोचें और कोशिश करें किसी तरह इसको सर्वाइव करें साल अगर हम सब सर्वाइव करके निकल जाएंगे तो देर बी ए लॉर्ड ऑफ अपॉर्चुनिटी दिस इज द कंट्री ऑफ टू हंड्रेड मिलियन पीपल एंड प्लस एंड देर इज अ लॉट टू डू जस्ट टू गिव एन एग्जाम्पल एज ए स्टील के प्रस्पेक्टिव बता रहा हूँ कि जो डेवलप नेशन है वो उनकी कर पर कैपिटा कंजम्पन स्टील की वो एट हंड्रेड के जी है पर ईयर ठीक है पर कैपिटा कंजम्पन और पाकिस्तान में फोर्टी टू के जी है सो वी आर नो वेयर अभी बहुत ज्यादा काम होना बाकी है एवरी थिंग विल कम जस्ट पास ऑन ट्राई टू पास ऑन दिस थैंक यू शामर आई जस्ट वॉन्ट टू थैंक ऑल द पैनलिस्ट एंड हैंड ओवर टू द होस्ट खावर अली शाह साहब शमर अब्बास आयशा मोरियाने आर स्टार्टअप शहीद अहमद एंड माहिर असद थैंक यू फॉर जॉइनिंग अस ओवर टू द होस्ट thank you um imran and faria and of course um our esteemed panelists um aisha and khawar saab and uh, summer and of course the startups as well um I, uh, to end this session i i believe ke aap logon ki jo maine conversation suni hai um uh, i i i am afraid that's the reality in pakistan ke hum logon हम लोग प्रॉब्लम्स में जो है वो ज्यादा घिरे हुए हैं एंड अपॉर्चुनिटीज जो हैं वो हैं बट दे आर थियोरेटिकली देयर बट प्रैक्टिकली वी हैव हैवन रियली कैपिटलाइज्ड ऑन आर प्रोग्रेस एज वी शुड हैव वीज अ वीज इफ आई टॉक अबाउट इकोनॉमीज लाइक श्रीलंका और मालदीव और बांग्लादेश और मलेशिया इंडोनेशिया मेरे जो एक टू सेंस हैं belonging from uh, one of the largest trade communities of Karachi and being an entrepreneur myself as well to capital flow karta hai jahan pe opportunities hoti hain pakistan ne pichle jo 3 4 decades guzare hain wo apni nuclear capabilities aur defense ke upar depend karte hue na pakistan ne apni us product ko sell kara hai duniya mein where we have fought wars for others and we've got paid for that um we haven't really focused on developing our um industries we don't have uh, i mean we can take probably 20 or 30 names top names across pakistan which in a population of 200 million should have been around 200 to 300 organizations across pakistan jo ke badi honi chahiye thi when i say um, i am talking about the likes of engros and descons Pakistan steel ban padi bhi hai PI we all know how bad it is performing uh jo airlines aati hain wo band ho jati hain we really don't have a very good framework for our um, economic wheel uh, which primarily i feel um, is the responsibility of the government sector ke wo apne aap ko competitive banaye uh, global economies se जो इन्वेस्टर होता है वो राउट कर जाता है जहाँ पे अपॉर्चुनिटीज आ रही होती हैं तो आई थिंक ओवरसीज पाकिस्तानी जस्ट लुकिंग एट देम स्पेंडिंग सेंडिंग ट्वेंटी बिलियन डॉलर इन रेमिटेंसेज वी शुड एक्चुअली बी लुकिंग एट देम कमिंग ओवर हेयर एंड इन्वेस्टिंग इन टू पाकिस्तान इन टू बिग प्रोजेक्ट पुटिंग अप सिलिकॉन वैलीज इन पाकिस्तान पुटिंग अप टेक एग्री टेक वैलीज इन पाकिस्तान क्लस्टर बेस्ड डेवलपमेंट होनी चाहिए डिपेंडिंग ऑन द नेचर जैसे अभी मरीन की बात हुई है तो हमें पूरी अपनी मरीन कोस्ट लाइन को हम जो है वो डेवलप कर सकते हैं एग्रीकल्चर को कर सकते हैं टेक्नोलॉजी को कर सकते हैं टेक्सटाइल्स को कर सकते हैं सो आई बिलीव अगर गवर्नमेंट उस लेवल पे सिर्फ पॉलिसी फॉर्मुलेशन नहीं बट 
उसको मेक श्योर sure अगर कर सकती है कि जी उसको उसकी इम्प्लीमेंटेशन भी प्रॉपरली हो जाए और उसको अगर हम क्लस्टर बेस जैसे मैंने कहा कि कर दें तो इफ इफ दैट कैन हैपन आई आई बिलीव पाकिस्तान वेर इट करंटली स्टैंडिंग एट ए टू हंड्रेड एंड फिफ्टी बिलियन डॉलर जी डी पी वी कैन मूव टूवर्ड्स बींग ट्रिलियन डॉलर इकोनमी ओवर द नेक्स्ट कपल ऑफ डेकेट्स तो अगर हम अपने लॉन्ग टर्म विजन सेट कर दें और फिर उनको एनुअल ब्रेकअप कर दें कि ओके दिस इज वॉट वी हैव टू अचीव एवरी ईयर आई थिंक दैट इज वेन द बॉल एक्चुअली Uh, is going to start to get rolling otherwise we've been talking about opportunities and potentials for for longest of times but we haven't really materialized on that so coming on the realistic ground my my two cents to uh, to everyone around is um, especially to the government ke aap apne aap ko enabling environment in the true sense kare to business jo hai wo phir follow kar jayega uh, just to give you an example sorry for taking a couple of more minutes कि बहरिया टाउन के ऊपर हमने केसेस देखे बनते हुए वो एक पर्सपेक्टिव है बट वी आल्सो नीड टू एक्सेप्ट वी डोंट नीड टू हाइड दिस थिंग अंडर द कारपेट कि पाकिस्तान में काम भी वही वैसे ही होता है जैसे मलिक रियाज और बहरिया टाउन कर रहे हैं सो so, अगर उनके ऊपर कोई एलिगेशंस लगाए जा रहे हैं तो वॉट ही हैज डिलीवर्ड ही कुड हैव ओनली डिलीवर्ड वेन ही फेमसली सेज के जी मैं फाइल को पहिए लगा देता हूँ एंड दैट इज द कल्चर दैट द गवर्नमेंट नीड्स टू डू अवे विद in order to have a better framework where we don't have any bahria towns or malik riyas coming up or uske piche phir nap pad jaye to belonging from the business community the people who are not willing to put up big projects in pakistan is ke unko ye dar hota hai ke hamare piche jo hai wo nap aa jayegi and wohi wo pakistani ja ke duniya bhar mein middle east ke andar america ke andar europe ke andar wo apne expansions kar lete hain far east ke andar expansions kar lete hain तो दिस इज वेरी इंपॉर्टेंट कि हम अपने फ्रेमवर्क को जो है वो बहुत अच्छे तरीके से जो है वो इम्प्लीमेंट भी कर लें रूल्स तो हैं लॉस तो हैं बट उनकी इम्प्लीमेंटेशन नहीं है आज मैं डीसी से जाके कहीं पे भी किसी भी डिस्ट्रिक्ट से जाके बात करता हूँ ही इज अनएबल टू फेसिलिटेट इन्वेस्टमेंट इन हिज डिस्ट्रिक्टचुअली द चीफ मिनिस्टर ऑफ हिज डिस्ट्रिक्ट प्राइमरिली लेकिन वो काम ही नहीं करता है तो इफ वी कैन एम्पावर एट द डीसी लेवल वेर प्रोजेक्ट आर ड्रिवन in within the district i see ke pakistan mein 100 200 billion dollar ki investment aana over the next 2 3 saal is not a huge thing it's just about having the right kind of approach of doer than actually just waiting for someone else to do things for us so that is my um, conclusion and of course i i really hope that we all learn from each other over here and we all um, are hopefully able to deliver on our own fronts that we are fighting um, or we are actually working for i would say so thank you very much to uh, once again to all the panelists for being part of it and i look forward to having more sessions uh, with more stakeholders where we can add value to um, each other thank you very much thank you thank everyone. you uh, panelists and thank you the moderators thank I you i look forward to seeing you all okay allah hafiz